want to talk to you guys about GBlocks Gene Fragments Gems. Uh, we're going to focus uh, today on you know, specifically designing GBlocks Gene Fragments to be used in the uh, iGEM competition and, and specifically to build the uh, genetic machines that uh, everyone and all these teams are interested in. So we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, to start out with, I um, just wanted to give a little brief background on uh, IDT as a company. So IDT was founded in 1987 by Dr. Joseph Walder, who's a, uh, who at the time was a professor at the University of Iowa here. We've grown to be the largest custom oligonucle oligonucleotide manufacturer in the world since then. Um, <clears throat> and we have six locations uh, located throughout the world and produce a great number of our products, in fact 95% of them, uh, in less than 24 hours and ship them to people. So we're, we're used to working um, on tight deadlines and we're able to get things out to customers very quickly. The map here gives uh, just an overview of the locations uh, that we have throughout the world. As you can see, we have locations in the United States, in Europe, and in Singapore, which allows us to distribute uh, oligos to customers throughout the world uh, very quickly and with very high quality. We make <clears throat> a great number of oligos. As, as I mentioned, we are the largest custom oligonucleotide manufacturer in the world, and we produce up to 44,000 oligos per day um, and ship those to many, many different countries. We also have a great customer support group which allows customers like yourselves to call IDT and discuss any questions that you might have with our products or with your experiments, and uh, we try and offer as much support as we can. So for many years, IDT has been known for its oligos, uh, but we're much more than just an oligonucleotide company. Uh, we do a lot of work that involves next generation sequencing, uh, qPCR, genotyping, uh, RNA interference, and synthetic biology and gene synthesis. And that's really what I want to talk about today, and specifically one particular product, the GBlox gene fragments. For those of you that haven't heard of these, uh, GBlox gene fragments are long, very accurately synthesized fragments of DNA that are double-stranded. Uh, we can synthesize them anywhere from 125 to 2,000 bases. Uh, we sequence verify those, and we deliver those in um, a, a fairly quick turnaround time. And we, we send those out normalized to an amount of 200 nanograms. Recently, we've included the ability to order mixed bases in, um, in G-blocks. And I'll talk about that more in a few slides here. Uh, but that's, it's a really interesting uh, development that we've had. So as you can see here, the turnaround time is shown in the table on the left here. And uh, as you can see, for the most part, our G blocks are made in you know two to five business days. So we're able to, to make these much much faster than traditional gene synthesis and give these out to our customers so that they can begin work immediately with with their products. You can also see the pricing here. Um, in general, our pricing is is considerably lower than traditional gene synthesis, and so that allows you to uh, you know get more products for the amount of money that you have. Of course, we want to be able to support iGEM teams. We've we've supported iGEM for several years now, and we're continuing that sponsorship this year. So I want to just take a minute and introduce the 2015 IDT iGEM sponsorship. This year we'll be offering 20 kilobases of free GBlox gene fragments to to all teams in the iGEM competition. All you need to do to access your uh, 20 kilobases of free GBlocks is to go to the website idtdna.com forward slash iGEM and you can register your team and uh, get an account set up to get those free GBlocks. One thing to note, registration takes up to five business days, so make sure and get registered early. Registration doesn't cost anything and uh, takes very little time, so get that done as soon as possible and we'll make sure that we can get the sequences or the GBlocks to you as quickly as possible. Currently we have about 70 teams uh, in the iGEM competition that have registered for this, so uh, there's already been a lot of activity and we're very excited about that. All right, I want to go ahead and jump into the uses of GBlox gene fragments. And I want to spend some time talking about uh, the, the use that we initially designed GBlox for, which is gene construction. We'll go through some methods uh, for doing that. But I also want to talk about some of the other uses that have developed in the couple of years that we've had this available. Um, 
our customers have, have found many different uses for these G-blocks, including using the double-stranded DNA as substrates for enzymes, uh, using them as template for in vitro transcription, the creation of recombinant antibodies and qPCR controls, and of course one of the newest and most exciting technologies in molecular biology, the CRISPR-Cas9 genome modification system. So let's, let's go ahead and jump right in and talk about gene construction to begin with. Um, there's many different things that can be built with GBlox gene fragments, and of course, one of the, the building blocks for the iGEM competition are the BioBricks parts. Um, the nice thing about ordering GBlox and, and ordering these as synthetic DNA is that you can customize your BioBricks parts. This allows you to order things outside of the repository or to ch make changes very rapidly to things in the repository so you can get them to work exactly as you would like them to in your experiments. We can also codon optimize components in BioBricks. So this allows you to change the codon optimization if you're using this in an, organ in, in an organism other than what it was originally designed for. We have codon optimization tools available on the website. They're uh, straightforward and easy to use, fairly basic codon optimization. We also have a design group uh, here at IDT, and the design group can assist you in more advanced codon optimizations. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the presentation. But, you know, besides making individual bio bricks, one of the really nice things about G-blocks and the fact that they're, they can be synthesized up to two kilobases in length is that you can, you can begin to build complete circuits with G-blocks. So you don't need to order individual components and put those components together. You can order multiple components together as a single G-block. Uh, so you can save some time and save some cloning by ordering these larger chunks, um, and you can get these put them into your system and uh, move on with your experiment. Of course, there's many other things that you can do with G-blocks, many other parts that you can build. One thing I want to remind everyone is the iGEM rules for the parts construction state that you must not include the restriction sites uh, that are listed here in, in your, uh, um, in, in, in the, the parts that you're making. So, you know, we want to avoid EcoR1, XBA1, SPE1, and PST1. So in designing these, this is another thing that the design group here at IDT can assist with. We can scrub these restriction sites out of sequences. We can code on optimize sequences so that, that they're not including these. Um, and that's something we can do quite rapidly for uh, the individuals in the iGEM competition. All right, so let's talk about assembly methods here a little bit. When we designed the G-Blox gene fragments, it was uh, right around the same time that Dan Gibson was designing the Gibson assembly method. And so we were able to work with, with scientists, uh, including Dan Gibson, to test our G-Blocks. And we ended up uh, really liking the results of the Gibson assembly method. Um, I want to run through just briefly how it works. Essentially what you can do is you can order G-Blocks with overlapping uh, homology to uh, other G blocks. Uh, these, these overlaps are generally 20 to 40 base pairs in length. Um, and multiple G blocks can be designed to have these overlapping regions. These overlapping fragments can simply be put into a single uh, tube containing the Gibson assembly master mix. And in one reaction, these will be assembled into a complete circular product that can go directly into transformation sequencing. And you can screen for the correct colonies and move on with your experiment. So how does the master mix work? Well, it's composed of three different enzymes. Um, the first enzyme is a mesophilic enzyme isolated from E. coli, and this enzyme's a nuclease. The nuclease chews back in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Um, the other two enzymes are thermophilic polymerases, and it's, it's important to note that this first enzyme is a mesophilic enzyme because this reaction takes place at an elevated temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. What that means is this enzyme is only active for a short period of time, after which it denatures and stops chewing back. The activity is, is long enough, however, that it can chew back and create single-stranded uh, fragments of DNA in these overlapping ends. So these regions of homology, be now being single-stranded, can hybridize together. Once they hybridize together, the polymerase can extend and fill in any gaps, and the ligase can create a covalently bonded molecule. Of course, once this is all done, the molecule can be transformed and selected for in uh, your bacterial cells.
So it's a very, a fairly simple but a, a very elegant system for creating uh, these larger constructs with multiple fragments in a short period of time. And of course, since the Gibson Assembly Kit came out, uh, there's been many other kits that have came out that do very similar things. Uh, Clone Tech has a kit that does it. Uh, pretty much all of the suppliers have these kits. We've tested a lot of the kits, and we find that a lot of the kits work very well with uh, GBlocks gene fragments. So um, we are certainly uh, we certainly don't require anyone to use the Gibson kit. There's lots of options out there, but we have had a, had a long experience with the Gibson kit, and we've been uh, very happy with the results. Let me start back again um, explaining just briefly the um, the CRISPR-Cas9 system. As I mentioned, the Cas9 protein is one of the two components that's needed uh, to direct site-directed mutagenesis within within the genome. Um, the Cas9 protein itself is has the um, the nuclease domains in it and actually creates a double stranded break in the genome. The other component is the single guide or the short guide RNA. Uh, this is a fragment of RNA that's uh, around 100 bases in length and contains the target region. This is the region that defines the specificity of where this complex will attach. So essentially, this is the part that tells the complex uh, what sequence of DNA to bind to, and then the DNA is clipped. So we need these two components in the cell to activate the CRISPR-Cas9 system. In many of the, in the most common systems that are used, these two components are, are brought into the cell on a single plasmid. Um, this is called a, uh, uh, a combined plasmid or a dual plasmid. Um, so this plasmid has often, a, in mammalian cells, a CMV promoter that drives the Cas9 uh, gene which makes the Cas9 protein, and then a second promoter, usually a U6 promoter, that drives the expression of the short guide or the single guide RNA. Um, so this is a method that works well. Uh, this can be, these plasmids can be constructed by simply ordering um, the plasmid from a variety of sites. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And um, cloning in the, the either just the, the 20 bases of the target region or the entire uh, single guide RNA. What uh, we suggest our customers do, and this is, this is also what the suggestion of several protocols online, is to simply order the single guide RNA with a U6 promoter on it, and this can be cloned directly into these plasmids. Um, once it's cloned in there, the plasmid can be transfected into the cells, and the CRISPR-Cas9 system can do its job. We've also seen customers, and tested a few, th a few times ourselves, using the G-Block directly without cloning it. So getting a G-block that has a U6 promoter and the uh, single guide RNA and transfecting that directly along with a protein, uh, along with a plasmid that expresses the Cas9 protein. So this is another way to get uh, the parts into the system. This is uh, slightly less work in that you don't need to clone the G-block into the, the, lar the larger plasmid. This is simply a direct transfection. Um, this is a method that we've tested in-house with uh, HEC-293 cells, and I'll show you some data on that in a few slides. Finally, there's a, a third method that is used um, that calls for creating uh, in vitro transcribed RNA and using that RNA, most typically with microinjection, to put that into the nucleus of a cell, often with uh, embryos. This is a method that works well if, you, uh, if you're able to use microinjection. We don't recommend this method if you're using transfection, and I'll show you some data on that in a few slides, which will uh, indicate why that is the case. Before we jump into that, though, I want to just briefly talk about what happens after the double strand break has been formed. So in, in creating the CRISPR-Cas9 um, complex, we can target the double-stranded break to wherever we want in the cell. And once that double strand break has happened, the cell needs to repair this break so that it can survive and go on to replicate. The most efficient method of, of repairing double-stranded breaks in, in mammalian cells is using the non-homologous end-joining repair pathway. This is an error-prone repair pathway, and because it's error-prone, there's a, the high probability of getting an indel, a short insertion or deletion, at the breakpoint where the repair has happened. This indel often disrupts the activity of the gene, so this is a good way to create gene knockouts. 
But of course, people want to do more than knock out genes. We want to actually add uh, the genetic material to uh, to these cells that we're trying to modify. And one of the ways to do that is to use homology-directed repair. And so the other repair mechanism that can repair double-stranded breaks is the homologous recombination repair pathway. This pathway, as the name implies, relies on homology of other DNA sequences to facilitate the repair. And by doing so, this can create uh, an error-free repair. Um, this, this repair can be driven by putting in uh, what we call donor DNA, that is DNA that has sufficient homology on each side of the double-stranded break that the homologous repair pathway can recombine this and insert it in there. And of course, if you have genetic material of interest between these homologous regions, you can insert that genetic material in the process. And so by doing so, this is a great way to create a, a genetic insertion uh, rather than just a deletion. And of course, these fragments, uh, these donor DNA, can also be made from G-blocks. And this is something we can assist you in designing. So just to, to briefly recap, G-blocks are really nice for um, designing the, the single guide RNAs. Uh, and they can be designed with the U6 promoter. This is an example of a design uh, that is used quite often. Uh, what's shown in red here is the actual U6 promoter. What's shown in black in ends is the actual targeting region. So this is the place you would you would place the the sequence that you're you're trying to target. And in green is the rest of the uh, single guide RNA. So this construct can be used over and over again, and you can target multiple sites within the genome. We have a lot more information on this at, the, at our CRISPR page at idtdna.com slash CRISPR. I want to mention, too, that there's some protocols that are available online. Um, and one of the great protocols to start with, I think, is a protocol that came out of George Church's lab a couple of years ago. George Church, for those of you who don't know, is a professor at Harvard and has been one of the pioneers of the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing system. Um, he published a paper, and we're very pleased to see that he included a reference to GBlox gene fragments, uh, and it includes directions to design um, the short guide RNA out of GBlox using the, the um, the sequence that I described here on this page. Again, you can find this paper at uh, idtdna.com forward slash CRISPR. This is a great way to uh, to get started with this and works well in, in a lot of the basic mammalian cells. Um, and as I mentioned, you can also directly transform G blocks into cells. We'll have a uh, protocol available at the location on the website here, idtdna.com forward slash CRISPR. One other website that I encourage everyone to visit if they're interested in doing CRISPR or if they just want to learn more about CRISPR is the AdGene website. AdGene is a great non-for-profit repository of, of uh, plasmids and has a great number of, of CRISPR plasmids. So there's, there's plasmids that contain the Cas9 gene and the Cas9 gene being optimized for a variety of different um, organisms. So there's a great deal of of plasmid availability there. There's also a, a huge wealth of knowledge there. There are protocols that are available. There are quick user guides. And there's references to the, the rapidly growing body of literature that cites the CRISPR-Cas9 um, genome editing system. So it's a great place to, uh, to use as a resource for information on CRISPR. All right, as I mentioned, we've done some work here at IDT uh, looking at uh, CRISPR um, and using GBlox gene fragments, um, directly transfecting GBlox gene fragments um, and using these linear products as the short guide RNA. What you can see here is that in the HEC293 cells that we test this in, we see a nice uh, activation of the CRISPR-Cas9 system using the um, short guide RNAs. Um, as, as G blocks. So we get a nice, across a broad range, there's a nice uh, activation, uh, and, and we, get, we, we get a lot of modification. You can see this is the cleavage um, shown by the mismatch in the nuclease assay. In contrast, directly transfecting the in vitro transcribed RNA gives us a, a, a less robust uh, uh, effect. And we were a little puzzled with this at first, but the reason for this turns out that the in vitro transcribed RNA 
often activates the or triggers the innate immune response system in cells, particularly obviously in eukaryotic cells. Um, and this this immune response can be strong enough that we actually see uh, a significant degree of cell death. And so uh, using in vitro transcribed RNA is not one of the, the recommended uh, protocols, with the exception of, of those individuals that are doing uh, microinjection and in very specific cell lines. Um, we, again, will have more information available at uh, idtdna.com forward slash CRISPR, and you can always email us with questions at genes at idtdna.com. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about CRISPR. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier on, I wanted to talk briefly about using um, G-blocks as libraries and creating uh, variation in G-blocks. And we're able to do that uh, with the ability, the recent ability that we have to incorporate mixed bases into our G-blocks. So as you can see here, we, we have several rules that are set up uh, that govern what, what we can accept uh, immediately online. Um, these are these are somewhat uh, restrictive, um, and so what we offer online to be able to order right away are G blocks that are between 250 and 500 base pair in length, and have a variable region that's not too close to either end. Um, it needs to be more than 125 base pair from each end, and the variable region needs to be limited to a region of 1 to 18 bases right in there. Um, and if you have something uh, a desire for something like this, this can be ordered directly on the website. And these types of things work great for, um, you know, changing catalytic sites or, or, you know, adding some variation in there so you can select for the best catalytic sites or the best binding sites uh, or, you know, antibody engineering, different things like this. But we also recognize that some of our customers want uh, a more complex library, and we're more than happy to review those um, individually. We, we simply can't accept those immediately online. So if you have more complex libraries or if you have more questions about what, what we could design as a library, please email us at genes at idtdna.com and we'll be more than happy to review any of the requests that you have for uh, GBlox libraries. Okay, one more um, application uh, that I wanted to talk about just real briefly for uh, GBlox is using GBlox gene fragments as synthetic templates for qPCR. This is something that a lot of individuals have turned to because it's, it's very quick and very easy to generate accurate synthetic template for qPCR, and it's, it's a great way to design standards. One of the, the real benefits of using GBlox is that you can combine multiple synthetic templates onto a single G block. And so if you're multiplexing or doing qPCR that involves multiple templates, you can include those all together and, and always know that when you're creating your standard curves, you have an equimolar ratio of each template uh, present in that standard curve. Um, we usually recommend that you separate the templates uh, with a few bases. Um, you can use a series of T bases, or what a lot of a lot of people like to do is use a uh, restriction site in here. Um, and that way, if there's any crosstalk between templates, you can simply digest the G, the G block before using it as a template and eliminate that uh, crosstalk. This is just an example of some of the in-house data we have using uh, the sequence above in an, an actual qPCR multiplex reaction. What you can see here is that there's a nice consistent increase in the signal as we, as we increase the copy number, and we get a nice, very robust uh, set of curves that are generated from the, uh, the qPCR results. So it's a really nice way and a very easy way to create some standards for your qPCR. All right. We've went through a few different methods of using G-Blocks, and I want to take some time now and talk about some of the iGEM teams that, that have used G-Blocks in the past um, and some of the successes that they've had. And one of, the, one of my favorite uh, stories to talk about comes from the 2013 overgrad winner of iGEM, which is the, uh, the Paris Betancourt team. The team uh, decided to pick the uh, challenge of identifying in the field uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is, is a very hard to identify bug and identifying tuberculosis that has uh, drug resistance before you actually start treating is extremely challenging. So their idea was to use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to target the multi 
multi drug resistance gene, but they're not targeting it in the usual way. They're not trying to make a genetic modification. They're simply creating a double-stranded break in the genome of the organism. And of course, once you create a double-stranded break in the genome of an organism, it activates a repair system. And in prokaryotic cells, this repair system is activated by the SOS response system. The One of the genes that is upregulated during the SOS response is the RecA gene. And so what they did was they took the promoter for the RecA gene and added that to a laxi fusion. Um, by doing this and by placing uh, the organism in some XGAL, they were able to then change the color of the XGAL from clear to blue. Um, anyone that has done blue-white screening on cells knows, knows uh, how this reaction works. So this, this is a very nice, very elegant method to target uh, a, a single drug resistance gene in a bug, and they figured out a way to use it in the field as well, or at least to, to potentially use it in the field. Um, and the way they came up with was to incorporate the CRISPR and the RecA laxi fusion uh, plasmid into a phage, which can be integrated into the tissue. Uh, this can be put into a bag and a sample can be deposited in this bag. The, the bag itself would contain growth medium for the tuberculosis. And so as the, as the TB starts to grow, this phage can attack and insert the genetic material into the organism. And of course, if, if the SOS response system is activated because it's cut um, by the identification of the multi-drug resistance gene, the laxi gene will be turned on and the liquid will turn blue that's in there. So it's a very elegant method and a very simple method that can be used in the field by someone who doesn't have a lot of, of uh, lab equipment or necessarily a lot of medical experience. So it, it, it's an ingenious idea and uh, just one of the great examples of, of the thinking that is done here at the iGEM competition. One other team that I, that I want to mention is the uh, 2000 12 Freiburg team. This team was interested in designing uh, talons. Talons are, of course, a, um, a slightly older genome modification system, but one that works very well. It's a system that uh, requires the design of a protein to target uh, different, different sequences of DNA. And this protein is, is a modular protein. It's, it's designed in a way that has uh, motifs, individual motifs that recognize individual bases of DNA. You assemble multiple motifs together and in doing so you can target uh, specific sequences of DNA. Of course this is quite challenging to do because when you assemble these motifs you're essentially creating multiple repeats uh, throughout the sequence. Um, the way they figured out to do this was, was to assemble repeat, uh, to assemble two, two motifs at a time and create an array of all possible different combinations of bases here. They then uh, assembled these in a way that allowed them to be, uh, to be glued together essentially using type 2S restriction endonucleases. And this allows them to essentially build um, different talons as needed. So they were able to design a very um, efficient assembly method for these rather challenging to build proteins um, and something that uh, was again a very elegant and very ingenious method uh, that was used here in the iGEM competition. So with that, I want to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, I want to make sure we save some time for questions here. I want to just mention before we stop, uh, there are some, some locations for information. You can always go to the uh, CRISPR page at idtdna.com forward slash CRISPR. We have webinars there. I, I did a webinar earlier this year on CRISPR itself. So if you want more information than what I've provided today, that's a great resource to start with. We also have uh, many CRISPR articles there, peer-reviewed publications, frequently asked questions, and a lot more information. This is something we're updating quite often, so uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, I also want to mention the design group that we have here at IDT. Uh, we're, we're here to help you and we especially like to help the iGEM teams. So if there's any design questions or design requests that we can help you with, we're more than happy to take a look at that. The examples of some of these requests are, are as follows here. We did a uh, design for an individual that needed to have a, a rather large sequence that had no C's on one strand and no G's on the other strand uh, and coded for a, a specific protein, so we are able to design this for them. We've been able to generate um, unique codon tables for codon optimization given um, sequencing information. 
Um, and a another example is we were able to minimize CPG dinucleotides in a specific uh, coding sequence and at the same time maximize the GC content in the third codon position. So just a few examples of, of some of the different types of, of optimizations we can do for individuals. Um, and again, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Just uh, shoot us an email at genes at idtdna.com. Lastly, I'd just like to end with uh, the list of all of our resources here. Uh, Again, if you want to register for your 20 kilobases of free GBlox gene fragments, just go to idtdna.com forward slash iGEM. Our CRISPR resources are at our CRISPR page, and uh, more information on GBlox is available at idtdna.com forward slash GBlox. As always, you can uh, get help, design issues, and uh, much more information by emailing us at genes at idtdna.com. And we also have a section of our website idtdna.com forward slash decoded, which has a, uh, a lot of general information on topics, including synthetic biology, but also including many of the other products that we have, qPCR, uh, next-gen sequencing, you name it, it's going, to be, it's going to be there. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, turn this back over to, to Hans, and we'll take any questions that you guys have. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to, uh, to join us today, and uh, good luck in the competition. All right, great. Um, that was a great presentation, Adam. Thanks for doing that. And uh, at this time, we will take any questions that you have, and it can be on anything, you know, related to what Adam talked about or anything that, you know, we might know about. So if you haven't already done so, you can type that into the questions box. It's in the right-hand side of your screen in the GoToWebinar software. And you can just pop that out by clicking on the little plus sign or the uh, up arrow, depending on whether you're on a Mac or a PC and it will expand so you can type into it. So if you haven't done so, please do that right now. And I guess we will just jump right into the questions. So the first question we got is somebody who wants to know if, instead of just getting stuff to assemble their own construct, can we give them a uh, an expression plasmid or synthesize a complete gene for them to express a protein? Sure. So we do have a gene synthesis service here, and we can certainly um, make genes for people that are cloned into plasmids. We, we focus on cloning into very simple plasmids, and so the majority of our plasmids are puck-based plasmids, and so they're plasmids that don't have, um, uh, that don't have a lot of, uh, of you know, options for expression. And we do have a few plasmids that have the uh, T7 and T5 promoters in there that are used for in vitro transcription. So, you know, we can drive um, transcription that way. But that's about all that we have available. We really design our, our genes to be manufactured as quickly as possible so we can get them in your hands and so that you can subclone them into whatever expression vector you would like to use. Um, just quickly on that, Adam, is uh, would a gene construct or a... Uh, a GBlox gene fragment library construct be included in the, the promotion? Oh, yes, uh, they would be. Um, we, the way we work the promotion, as I mentioned, you, get, you have the ability to get um, 20 kilobases of uh, free GBlox. We basically give you um, uh, the, what the value of 20, 20 uh, one kilobase G blocks will be. And you can use those for a variety of different synthetic biology components. So you could order libraries with that. Of course, libraries are, are a bit more expensive than our standard G blocks, and so you don't get quite 20 kilobases of library uh, if you want to order it that way. But we can, we can certainly help you with that. And you can also use the, that. Uh, uh, those monies for um, genes themselves or mini genes. Okay. Um, somebody asked a question. I know this has come up in past discussions, so I thought this was a great question to ask. When doing CRISPR guide RNAs, the single guide RNAs, is it possible to do multiple guide RNAs on a single 2KB G block? Um, this person has actually tried to do this before and has received some um, complexity problems. Sure. Yeah. No. And that's that's a great question. Um, so one of the real 
one of the real uh, uh, benefits of using the CRISPR-Cas9 system is that the system seems to work quite well when you target multiple sites. So you can you can include essentially multiple gRNAs together and target multiple sites at once within a cell. So it's extremely powerful. Unfortunately, we have uh, trouble synthesizing certain sequences, and one of the problems that we have is repeat sequences. And of course, when, when you're putting multiple gRNAs on a single um, G block, all but the 20 bases of the target region is the same, so essentially you're creating large repeats. And unfortunately, those repeats are very challenging for us to manufacture, and it's something that we can't manufacture as, as uh, a single G block. Now, what we can do is we can make uh, multiple separate G blocks, and those G blocks can be directly transfected into the cells. Um, they can also be cloned into um, plasmids individually and, and be transfected in that way. So we don't have a great answer to, to give you something that you can use immediately, but we can make the parts that would allow you to assemble it uh, in a way that could be used by yourself. OK. Um, the next question is, uh, there's been some discussion, quite a bit of discussion about using GBLAX gene fragments for cloning single guide RNAs. Um, what this person wants to know is, just using basic cloning methods, can they order a specific GBLAX gene fragment guide RNA and then clone them into the expression vector that they need for their particular CRISPR system? Sure. Uh, the the GBLOX gene fragments work well with a lot of different cloning systems, and so you know you can use traditional restriction cloning, you can use type 2S restriction cloning, um, you can use blunt cloning, um, and it, of course you can always use you know a Gibson or Gibson-like cloning method. Um, and depending on what what plasmid you're going into, um, they may be set up to use one of those methods. And so you can simply order your G-blocks to work with one of those methods. It may be adding a type 2S restriction site to each end. It may be adding a traditional restriction site to each end. Um, whatever you want to do, you can, you can simply order your G-block in a way that, that it can be cloned. And if you have any questions about how to design that, that's uh, something we can, we can most likely answer very quickly for you at genes at idtdna.com. Okay. Um, next question is the exonuclease that's in, used in the Gibson assembly reaction. It uh, requires the DNA to be linear, but does it matter if the DNA is blunt ended or if there are already um, sticky ends from, say, a restriction digest? Sure. Yeah, no, and that's a good question as well. Um, it doesn't require that the ends be blunt ended, uh, so it'll work. Um, Interestingly, it'll work with both a three prime and a five prime overhang that are created by the the different restriction enzymes. So um, you can cut it with any of the uh, any of the restriction enzymes that'll linearize your plasmid and go from there. One of the recommended methods, though, for using uh, uh, for creating for linearizing your plasmid is to actually use PCR and reverse amplification. So essentially, you can design primers to amplify from any spot within the plasmid and and amplify a linear product out of that and use that for Gibson cloning. The benefit there is you're not restricted to uh, areas within the plasmid that have restriction sites. So for instance, if you want to completely remove the multiple cloning site from your plasmid, uh, you can you can simply reverse amplify all of the plasmid except for the multiple cloning site and design your Gibson overlaps to, to match that linear fragment. Um, so it gives you a little more flexibility. The other benefit of using a, uh, a PCR product is you you generally have a lower amount of background. Um, what happens with restriction endonucleases is that when you when you do a digestion with them, you rarely cleave 100%. Um, in fact, you almost never cleave 100% of all of the molecules of the of the plasmid in there. And as plasmid tends to be super coiled um, in most cases, any of the the molecules that are not cleaved. Um, are going to transform with with high efficiency because of the the nature of the supercoiling, and so that can lead to a higher level of background and more screening that would need to be done to find the correct clone. 
Um, kind of on a related note to these questions, too. How are G blocks provided? Are they a linear DNA construct, or are they already within a plasmid? That's that they are provided as a linear construct, and they're, and they're not in a plasmid. And so that's an important distinction between our G blocks products and our genes products. The G blocks themselves are just the sequence you order, just a linear fragment. They normally come uh, uh, dephosphorylated on each end, but you can order them with a five prime phosphate on each end for no additional charge as well. And that phosphate, um, very specific applications, uh, is there anything that you would use that phosphate for beyond just blunt cloning? We pretty much just use the, uh, the phosphate for blunt cloning. So unless you're doing blunt cloning, it's actually to your advantage to not have the phosphate on there. One of the, one of the good examples of that would be if you're doing a restriction cloning and you're going to digest your G blocks uh, with a restriction endonuclease before you clone. You actually want to make sure and leave the 5' prime phosphates off of the G blocks so that there's no way that those linear G blocks can ligate into, uh, into your your vector. So I was being conversational there, and I realized it, it kind of brought up something that maybe we should be just a little bit more clear about. So with blunt cloning, there is a common kit, which is the topo blunt kit. And if you use the phosphates in that, it does not work, right? That's a great point to bring up, and you're absolutely correct with that. Yeah, the, the topo kit from uh, Life Technologies, which I, actually is uh, uh, now Thermal Fisher, um, if you use that kit, it requires that you not have phosphated ends. So you need to make sure not to order it with a 5' prime phosphate if you're using that kit. There's a couple other kits that are available uh, that are similar to the Topo kits that, uh, that are blunt cloning kits that also require that there not be a phosphate on the, on the 5' prime ends of the molecules. So make sure and look at your manufacturer's instructions uh, when you have one of those kits before you order your G-blocks to make sure you get the right thing. So just to summarize, it's basically it's a it's a linear, double-stranded piece of DNA that normally comes without a phosphate, but you can order it with the phosphate. It kind of looks like a, a PCR product. Yes, it's very much so. a PCR product. Very much so. Yep. Although you get to just tell it what sequence it's going to be by typing it in the computer. Yep, and that's that's the real advantage to it is is you get to you get to program in exactly what sequence you want simply by typing in the keyboard. Um, okay, so next question is, well, actually, before I answer this question, uh, we're, we're kind of coming to the end of the questions that people have asked. Uh, if you haven't asked a question, please, by all means, type it into the questions box. You know, if we get a bunch of questions right now, um, even if we don't have time for all of them, you will get a response to it. So this is a great time to ask your questions, and we can just follow up with people by email if we run out of time. Um, so the next question that I'm going to ask is uh, re related to Gibson assembly again, which is, are there any sequence limitations to Gibson assembly, um, such as working with like repetitive sequences? Sure. I know. And that's another great question. Uh, in the original paper that was published by Dan Gibson um, a couple of years ago in Nature, um, they, they proposed using this to assemble things in the hundreds of thousands of kilobase range. Now, that's going to be quite challenging for anyone to do, including um, scientists like uh, Dr. Gibson. Um, but really, you know, there's not an upper limit on the size range that you can use. I think the real limitation, the practical limitation that people are going to run into is the size limit uh, of, that the plasmids will handle. And of course, that can be determ that's determined partially by the genes that are encoded on the plasmid, and partially it's determined by uh, what, is, what is inserted in there, whether there's any toxic sequences, and the copy number of the plasmid. But in general, if you keep things below the 10 kilobase range, um, you know, you're going to be able to, uh, to most likely get things to work. Now, one of the things that we do run into is that as you add more and more fragments to, to these assembly reactions, the efficiency of the assembly goes down. And what we see is by the time you get out to you know, around four or five uh, fragments uh, being added to these kits, um, the, the efficiency goes down and becomes quite low. So uh, 
we we recommend that you that you try and assemble things in in ways that allow you to assemble no more than three or four uh, fragments at one time and do a plasmid. So if you need to assemble more of them, we suggest that you do it in a hierarchical manner, meaning that you assemble multiple groups of three or four, take those assemblies and assemble that into a larger uh, a larger final assembly. There are some kits that are available uh, in NEB, New England Biolabs, uh, has uh, some kits that are designed for uh, multi-fragment assemblies and work better with, uh, with you know, a larger number of assemblies. So I'd encourage you to take a look at their website. They also generally recommend very specific E. coli cell lines to, uh, to use with that. Um, and uh, from what we have found, that, that makes a big difference. So look into their recommendations um, if you need to assemble some larger stuff. You can always uh, call us or email us at genes at idtdna.com and we can give you more specific information on that as well. Okay, uh, so we're actually at the end of the list of questions, but I'll just kind of give people a minute to ask any additional questions. Um, I was just going to bring something up really quick here again, which is just to remind people about the uh, the next webinar that we'll be doing for the iGEM teams, which is going to be in June. And, uh, you know, since a lot of you, maybe you haven't even started working on your products, projects or you're in sort of the planning phase or whatever, we're going to come back and talk to you again in June. We'll have uh, another presentation that will go into some detail, uh, depending on the kinds of questions that we get between now and then from the iGEM teams. But also, you know, we want you to come back, you know, with any questions or any particular challenges that you're facing and, you know, let us know about them and then we'll see if we can help you sort those out. So um, please be on the lookout for that. That'll be coming up again in June. Uh, so, any more questions? Please type them into the questions box. Adam, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. I think we've covered just about uh, everything. Um, we are very interested to hear from you guys, and, and as I mentioned, we always like to help the iGEM teams. We aren't um, exactly sure what the topic of the next uh, the next session is going to be, and we we intentionally wanted to leave that open a little bit. So if you guys have suggestions, if there's things that uh, you would like us to explain or explore in more detail in the next uh, webinar, uh, please let us know. Uh, we're happy to to take your suggestions, and uh, we may just uh, build a webinar out of that for you guys. Uh, that, that is a great point. Um, okay, so that's looking like the end of questions. We haven't picked up any other questions here, so I guess we'll wrap it up with that. Um, Adam, thank you for the great presentation. I want to thank people for participating and asking questions. And uh, yeah, I, I really wish you all the best of success in your research, and hopefully uh, you'll get to meet some of the IDT people, um, possibly even Adam at the uh, iGEM Jamboree in the fall. So uh, it was great. Great webinar. Um, what else? So we'll be posting this webinar on our website. Uh, it's www.idtdna.com. We have a support and education tab. If you go there, you'll find a bunch of videos. Um, and this one will be posted there shortly. The slides, if you want to look at the slides and just take your time, go through them one at a time or whatever, or look at a specific slide, the slides will go on our SlideShare site, which is www.slideshare.net forward slash IDT DNA. So you can go there and find the slides for this webinar as well as previous webinars, previous presentations. And um, yep, I guess we will call it good there. Um, thanks a lot, Adam. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, everyone. And best of luck to all of you in the iGEM competition. All right. Stay in touch. Bye.